Greetings. Oh, so, so greeting. <laughs> Welcome to our session on addressing the 7% problem. Today we'll be talking about the FRAME project and the Carl ARL Marrakesh Treaty Implementation Project. My name is Victoria Owen from the University of Toronto, and I'm here today with Pascal Calarco from the University of Windsor, Catherine Klossick from the Association of Research Libraries, Bill Kasdorf from Kasdorf and Associates, Stephen Downey, the University of Illinois, and John Unsworth from the University of, of Virginia. And our, the CARL ARL uh, pilot uh, project implementation will be the first part of our presentation. Um, so we're talking about the Marrakesh Treaty and the implementation of that treaty um, for accessibility. And the full title of the Marrakesh Treaty is to facilitate access to published works for persons who are blind, visually impaired, or otherwise print disabled. It is the first user's rights treaty. It's historical and it's important. And it's linked to the human rights in the, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and in the Convention of Rights for People with Disabilities. The goal of the Marrakesh Treaty is to end the book famine, to change the availability of accessible formats from 7% to 1%. WIPO, the Marrakesh Treaty is a WIPO treaty agreement and it has 80 signatory countries. It was passed in June 2013 in Marrakesh, Morocco, and it provides an exception to copyright for the benefit of people who are blind, visually impaired, or otherwise print disabled. It's an international treaty and each country must ratify it and set its own uh, enabling legislation. Canada was the 20th key nation to accede to the Marrakesh Treaty and that signatory allowed Marrakesh to come into force on September the 30th, 2016, three months after Canada's accession. The USA ratified uh, on May the 8th, 2019 and we now have 20, 80 ratifications to date with 37 more in process. The Marrakesh Treaty provides a legal framework and it allows each country to develop its own enabling legislation. And all the national laws must comply with the requirements of the treaty. However, there's, there are variations in the legislative language among all of the Marrakesh Treaty. So there isn't one implementation it's the same as any other one. The Marrakesh Treaty has optional articles and Canada added a commercial availability clause and a royalties clause to our legislation. The United States did not. So the Marrakesh Treaty Task Force is working with Canadian authorized entities, the Bibliothèque Nationale et Archives, Bibliothèque et Archives Nationale de Québec, CELA, which is the Center for Equitable Library Access, and NELS, which is the National Network uh, for Equitable Library Services. We're working with those entities to understand how the legislation is operationalized in their process and what is required for the international lending component. As authorized entities, they are nonprofit entities and they provide education or information access. And authorized entities include uh, libraries and schools and other and other kinds of, of uh, educational and information services. And we've also been, the task force has been also conferring with legal experts in Canada and the United States on the implica implications of the differences in our laws. So when we want to do this pilot project together, we have to figure out how the two law, two sets of laws are going to work together. And in Canada and in this, with this project, the commercial availability clause is providing uh, a lot of complications for us. So it's quite problematic in the implementation. And that is with the production of the materials part of it and the export limitations. In the United States, they, there, are, there are other barriers, but not the same barriers. Um, as I said, every implementation is different. Um, so in section 1201 of the US Copyright Act, um, that is the section that prevents the breaking of technological measures or digital locks to access copyrighted works. Central to the Marrakesh Treaty is the ability to break the locks to make an accessible copy. 
So in the US, this is going to be handled by the rulemaking process. And every three years, the Register of Copyright issues exemptions for breaking the, te the technological protection measures or the digital locks. In this year's rulemaking, the Register of Copyrights modified Section 1201 regulatory language to reflect the relevant sections in the US Copyright Act that implement the Marrakesh Treaty, that's Section 121A. The Registrar concluded that without the proposed modifications, print disabled individuals would be adversely affected in their ability to engage in the non-infringing uses. So the updated language it says that it will expand the description of intended beneficiaries, and it will expand the copyrighted works covered to include literary works and previously published music works that have been fixed uh, in the form of text or notation, and adjust the reference to a market price of a mainstream copy, and instead use the, the, the word of the price of an inaccessible copy. Also this year, the Register of Copyrights renewed a rule allowing temporary, the temporary right to create accessible versions of motion pictures and to be able to use assistive technologies for people who are blind, visually impaired, or have print disabilities. In this and previous rulemakings, the Register of Copyrights has acknowledged that technological protection measures interfere with the use of assistive technologies. And the Register also acknowledged that there is a significant role of eBooks in improving accessibility for persons who are blind, visually impaired, or print disabled. So the CARL ARL task force for the implementation of the Marrakesh Treaty kicked off in September 2020. And the pilot is a collaboration between the Canadian Association of Research Libraries and the Association of Research Libraries on behalf of their member libraries. There are 140 research libraries in these uh, associations in Canada and the United States. And they have a collective holding of 760 million print and electronic works. The pilot libraries are two American libraries, research libraries, Cornell University and the University of Florida, and two Canadian research libraries, York University and Bibliotheque Archive Nationale de Quebec. The structure of the work of the task force has put put together a policy, a metadata systems, and a beneficiary working group. And the goal is to implement uh, the requesting and borrowing functions within each country to allow for cross-border exchange. And then after the pilot is concluded, to use the results of that pilot to recommend an implementation plan for CARL and ARL libraries. So the metadata working group uh, began in uh, this year in collecting sample records from each pilot library for each format. And we reviewed the MARC format fields used per library and per format. And then with that, decided on what required fields we're going to use in, in the pilot. What would be mandatory? What would be mandatory if applicable? What would be recommended? What is optional? And the considerations are uh, myriad. We looked at controlled text and free text fields, multilingual provisions, and how each um, uh, field would function with the, mar the market edit software. So we'll decide on fields for the pilot and evaluate and recommend the fields for the broader implementation. So I'll turn it over to Pascal now for the systems part of the implementation and other considerations. Thanks, Victoria. So when we look at this project, one would think that this is fairly straightforward. Uh, it's not that much different from a traditional circulation or uh, resource sharing, um, perhaps with the uh, only difference that in a Marrakesh fulfillment, the materials do not need to be returned to the library. Next slide. We can think of five high level uh, areas of work um, in this implementation. Uh, we already talked about the metadata issues. There's also digitization workflows that we need to consider. Libraries have been digitizing works for, you know, a couple decades now, but we haven't typically been producing those things 
in EPUB format, which may be the uh, preferred format for uh, integration with assistive technologies. There's a variety of approaches to discovery. You know, do we put all of the metadata records in one place, like in WorldCat or Hathi Trust or the Internet Archive, or do we have these uh, be a more distributed approach? Or do we um, do something uh, kind of uh, hybrid? Also with the digital repository, do we use a federated approach uh, similar to DPLA or have geographically defined territorial repositories in each country or use each uh, individual library as an endpoint for the digital item and then have shared metadata in a discovery layer above that. And finally, we have identity and access management issues because we have to ensure that these DRM free versions of works are only available to beneficiaries. Next slide. These are some um, challenges and decision points we've identified to date, starting with wanting to understand the functional requirements of uh, users, of uh, beneficiaries and their uh, technology kind of ecosystem. We need to consider that uh, this is going to scale across the globe eventually. And so we need to make sure that we have the lowest barriers for libraries to be able to implement this. I mentioned the variety of approaches with metadata and um, identity and access management and uh, the repository for accessible works. Um, you know, ideally we want to digitize a work once and then have that uh, be added to the corpus um, that's available globally. Next slide. Thinking about the user needs um, we have started to engage with CNIB and we'll be talking to the National Library for the Blind and um, also folks on uh, our campuses at the pilot libraries. Um, and these are some questions we're going to initially ask um, of the uh, campus partners and advocates for uh, those who have uh, print disabilities. And this is the focus of our beneficiary working group. Next slide. When thinking about the discovery of accessibility works, you know, eventually this will scale to any, you know, uh, public or academic library in North America and eventually uh, any of the Marrakesh uh, Treaty countries. So how do we ensure that these are all searchable and discoverable by all beneficiary users, regardless of where they're located? And how do we bring these uh, descriptions together uh, best in a consolidated catalog uh, from those contributing libraries? Next slide. Storage and preservation of these texts is also of uh, key consideration. So we need to do this within the context of digital preservation. Um, the formats can change over time as we know that um, these formats uh, continue to develop. And um, also the, the, the basic level of bit uh, integrity can be compromised. So we need um, things in place uh, to look at that as well. Next slide. The place that we're going to start is with our four partner libraries. And so we have recommendations for uh, revising MARC templates in each of those libraries. We'll implement those templates in the four libraries. We'll probably create local creation or local uh, location codes in each of the library uh, services platforms that we have. And um, 
will create uh, a either local or shared repository to store those texts in. Uh, we'll probably create a new patron group uh, for Marrakesh beneficiaries and allow um, only beneficiaries to be able to access that uh, location and, and that underlying repository. And then we'll start with um, library to library fulfillment requests, uh, similar to the ILL uh, workflows that we currently do. We recognize that um, eventually, of course, we want direct patron uh, discovery and delivery of all of these. We're uh, learning from other projects, including the Frame Project here and others um, in uh, this work. We're, I mentioned we're going to talk to campus accessibility officers and then uh, also uh, liaise with um, beneficiary advocacy groups. Next slide. This is the um, list of people who are on the task force. And we have a central email address where you can get in touch with us. We'd love to hear your thoughts and invite you to uh, uh, help us out with this project. That's the last slide for our project. I'll now turn it over to Bill to start with theirs. Thank you very much. Uh, let me get my screen share going here. All right, there we go. So I'm, uh, I'm Bill Kasdorf. I'm a publishing technology consultant and I do a lot of work in um, editorial and production workflows with a big focus on accessibility. I also do a lot of standards work. Uh, most relevant in this context are um, the uh, World Wide Web Consortium. I'm the publishing, uh, global publishing evangelist for the W3C and NISO. Um, let me get to full screen here. So the image that I'm showing on this slide is a picture of a woman looking shocked and saying, what? You just did all that work remediating that book and you can't share it? Well, I have to say, I could have used a picture of John Unsworth there instead. Uh, because that's really the origin of the frame project. He was a professor at Brandeis at the time and had a blind student who was majoring in film. And so they had to create uh, what are called audio descriptions. It's a confusing name because it's a description of the video aspect of the movie. Um, you can imagine how much work is involved in doing that. And at the, at the, at the end of all that work, he discovered that those uh, audio descriptions would not get shared. And he thought reasonably enough, this is ridiculous. So um, it turns out that it's, it's still to this day very common that uh, the disability services offices, they're commonly called DSOs, these are the people that take uh, a, a resource, an asset that's inaccessible to a given student and fix it basically, which is called remediation. For example, doing making those audio descriptions or putting image descriptions in for images or tagging a PDF, et cetera. And uh, it's widely believed that they cannot share those files. And they think it's not legal to do that. that. And what they really think is that if it's a violation of copyright. And that's in fact not true, but as an, as an indication of how common this is, uh, Blackboard is, is the most common learning management system and their accessibility aspect is called Ally. Uh, Nicholas Matthias, the product owner of, of Ally, did a study of uh, the, all the materials they've checked in since 2019. Two thirds of those educational materials that they checked it in for accessibility were duplicates. Only one third uh, of of them were unique. And that was out of 825.72 million assets. So uh, John basically wrote a grant, put together a team uh, that is a collaboration between academic libraries, 
repositories and uh, technologists and the, digi uh, the disability services offices at the participating universities. Sorry, this Zoom is blocking my advancing my slides. So um, it's a four year project funded by Mellon, actually two grants. We in, got an initial grant, uh, a two year grant, and we are now in the middle of the first year of the second grant uh, of, the, of the project. And it's, as I said, a combination of libraries, repositories, DSOs, and university presses. And the big part of the, uh, the work involved in FRAME is creating a repository where we can provide federated access to metadata and source files and remediated files. In other words, source files, files for a DSO to remediate, and then a place for them to put the files that have been remediated so somebody else can use those files. And then the DSOs have access to retrieve or deposit files and ensure that the recipients are qualified. And that's really one really important aspect that you need to understand that the DSOs provide is they're the ones that uh, are responsible for ensuring that uh, a given student or faculty member or recipient of the uh, of the remediated files is qualified to get them. The libraries and DSOs are at George Mason, Illinois, Northern Arizona, Ohio State, Texas A&M, Vanderbilt, and Virginia. And the repositories are Benetech Bookshare, which is a repository of all remediate, uh, all accessible content, Hadi Trust, which is millions and millions of uh, of assets. I think most people seeing this knows what Hadi Trust is, and you surely know what the Internet Archive is. So it's a lot of content that's available between these three repositories. And then the fourth repository that we've created at Virginia to uh, hold all the materials that did not originate in one of those three. Most uh, DSOs obtain the files to remediate either from the publisher or the bookstore or a faculty member. Uh, or a service like Access Text Network, et cetera. And so um, those files that they are able to interchange are put into Emma. And we're going to be adding ACE, which is the Accessible Content Portal from uh, the Ontario Council University Libraries. And that will be our test of Marrakesh because of testing out the kind of differences in the uh, exchange principles between the US and Canada. That's going to be, that's going to be interesting. So we, because of this misconception about copyright, the first thing we did was really an environmental scan uh, that focused on uh, addressing these legal issues for the DSOs. So we convened a, a group of legal experts in January 2019 at ARL in, in Washington uh, to uh, in a session called the Law and Accessible Text that resulted in a white paper reconciling civil rights and copyrights, the Law and Accessible Text, so that very clearly documents that uh, copyright does not prevent the sharing of these remediated files to uh, qualified recipients. And in that context, we also identified uh, not, the, not the legal uh, activity, but the uh, frame activity in general, uh, that there was no, we identified two things that are really needed. There was no really good uh, metadata model for remediated assets to describing how they have been remediated. What are they and how have they been remediated? So we have created a metadata model uh, and are implementing that. And then also clear need for education about accessibility and remediation uh, in academic and library contexts. So for the metadata model, uh, four different main aspects. A lot of uh, unique identifiers are needed to make, uh, manage all this content. And by the way, this metadata model really has two uses. One is discovery of, uh, of assets across all four uh, repositories. And so that involves a uh, kind of a massive unified search project that's been on, on ongoing since the beginning. And uh, metadata associated with these remediated files. So because that what a, what a DSO at one university is looking for is a, a file that has been remediated in a certain way that's how their student needs 
uh, the file to be remediated, and we need they need to be able to trust that uh, the metadata can can tell them that. Uh, so, in addition to the bibliographic metadata and administrative metadata, we have a host of remediation metadata, things like format, file type, features. Obviously, if if a if a book has tables or equations, those often require a lot of work in remediation. How how clean is the text on uh, on the uh, in the source file? Any comments that the previous uh, remediator can make, uh, and then of course the EPUB accessibility metadata. And so at this point, uh, still working on the unified search to refine that across the repositories, and also refining the the uh, user interface for the deposit of the remediator resources. Um, we're also developing uh, a more standardized batch upload process because you know one thing that happened in the first phase of the frame project is that all of these universities had a backlog of files. In fact, it was it was somewhat amusing that many of them didn't want to admit that they actually kept these files because they had been under the you know misconception that they were not able to share them. But they put so much work into them that they were not about to just trash them, right? So they had in, in one of the libraries had hundreds of files to contribute. Um, but of course, they all had their own way of keeping track of what. Uh, what the files were and what had been done to them, et cetera. So a fairly messy process. We're trying to standardize that in phase two. Again, integrating with two new partners, a repository partner, ACE, and a university, Ohio State. Uh, NISO is planning to create a uh, working group in uh, 2022 to standardize the metadata model that we've come up with so that it's uh, it can become an international, ultimately an ANSI standard also to create a membership organization so that this project is self-sustaining. We don't expect to get more money from Mellon, but we do expect to add more universities. So um, the membership model is uh, how that will, will be uh, enable this, this project to be self-sustaining going forward. And then uh, Stephen is heading up the project for creating these educational models, modules on information services for uh, graduate professional curriculum. So at this point, I will turn it over to Stephen. Thank you ever so much, uh, Bill. That was a fantastic uh, presentation. And thank you, my other colleagues, for their great presentation so far. I'm Stephen Downey, and I, I'm a professor of library and information science at the School of Information Sciences at the University of uh, Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, so that's sort of my contribution. I'm coming, coming at it from uh, library professional educator uh, role. I'm also the associate dean for research, so I find all of these uh, unique problems uh, absolutely fascinating. So what we're doing at Illinois in contribution to the um, uh, project, um, if we go back to the uh, list of people that we, or uh, we could, well, I'll just, yeah. So I just wanted to mention so it's teamwork. Um, and what you'll see there uh, in the dramatis personae um, is a wide range of skills uh, that are coming together. Um, you have me as sort of an academic educator, um, and we have uh, Professor Zay from University of Wisconsin, uh, Milwaukee, and she is an um, expert, a world-renowned expert on creating accessible and teaching accessible information uh, systems. Um, and she's helping us lead our education program. We are working in conjunction with Kyle Rimkus, who is the Illinois uh, Preservation Librarian and has been working on the frame Emma uh, systems metadata processing since the beginning of the project. So there's uh, practitioner uh, knowledge there. Uh, his colleague, uh, JJ Pianke, um, is the Applied Health Sciences Librarian. Um, and that's the unit in which our disability service uh, organization resides at the University of Illinois. It's called DRES, uh, Disability uh, Resources and Educational Services. So there's that li liaison there. Um, um, Professor Pianke is also uh, an expert and teaches in the area of accessibility, disability services. Jacob Jett is um, a postdoc of mine, and uh, he works at the, with me at the, the Hadi Trust Research Center. His expertise, his PhD is in metadata. And um, as we'll see in a minute, there is that tie-in in, in the project where we need to learn more and teach more about the unique metadata issues that um, 
arise when dealing with these kinds of services. Um, and then we have uh, Angie Anderson, um, who's from uh, Dres at uh, Illinois. And um, she has been historically part of this project from the beginning. She has been doing remediations of text for many, many years. Um, and is also consulting on how to create the organization that uh, Dean Unsworth would like to create um, to sustain all these efforts. And uh, she has assisted at the DREZ at uh, um, Illinois uh, with Alex Cordain. So you, what we're seeing here is a, a, a great team of different sets of skills. And the reason we need all these different skills, next slide, please. Um, we're developing a formal course, and the formal course is going to do uh, some multiple duties. Um, we, we, as professional for Masters of Library Information Science, uh, we'll be delivering it online so other folks from other schools can join without uh, difficulty. Um, and so to help train uh, library and information science professionals to, to take on these kinds of roles in this new environment. Um, but also we're going to fragment the, the materials and, and make it more modular so that we can take, we can grab, let's say, the lesson on metadata and have it stand alone uh, as a possible resource because we need to educate multiple people uh, in this realm. We, the people that work have their home bases in the library is one constituent, but you also have people that have their home bases in the teaching units or in the disability service uh, offices. And they don't know about metadata, it's not, their, it's not in their wheelhouse. So we're trying to bridge, use this education as a bridge between the different communities, the different offices and stakeholders. Um, and so that's why we're releasing materials online. And as part of the project in our promise to our funders, uh, the Mellon Foundation, the materials will be uh, 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 released under an open license so other library and information science education professionals can grab them, use them. Uh, libraries and DSOs can grab them, use them to train staff, to train graduate students um, as they come on board with the various uh, projects. Next, please. So uh, in general, we're looking to provide general background on disability issues in higher, higher education settings. So students, what kinds of disabilities, what are the challenges, what are the accommodations uh, that are available or are necessary. Um, we need to explain the work of DSOs and, and organizations like DREZ to the library side and explain the library side to the DSO uh, stakeholders. So it's, uh, again, that bridging aspect. Um, and to explain how to use the metadata. Um, there's a unique kind of metadata being developed by Bill and, and Jacob and the, and the, the team writ large. Um, so learning about how to uh, use it, how to create it, uh, and how to make it, take advantage of it is important for all stakeholders. Um, and the sort of nitty gritty of document file formats and different automated techniques that are available for remediation. Um, and also to explain the legal frameworks um, so that they're better informed within their organizations on what they can do. This, this uh, panel, for example, has uh, uh, helped to highlight uh, the, legal, um, the legal support for our actions that needs to um, get propagated uh, to the broader community. And of course, um, to introduce to all the stakeholders new opportunities for research. Uh, what's, what's next? What can we do to make things better? Next, please. So what we've had uh, over the course of the last year is the team coming together uh, under um, the primary intellectual um, leadership of Professor Jay. And uh, these are the tentative sort of units uh, in our proposed master's class uh, uh, syllabus. So you can see um, the different aspects that I've been trying to uh, articulate uh, here represented as uh, weekly lectures, weekly modules uh, for the class. So we have design guidelines, accessibility in uh, retrieval systems, which is a specialty of Professor Jay's, um, and understanding the, the general climate of, of work with disabilities and how to do uh, user studies and so on. Next slide, please. 
um, design tools, uh, the accommodations, challenges in designing, uh, an assessment of the systems and services that um, uh, frame participants would uh, undergo, and of course, you know, what are the open questions, open challenges in services uh, with people with disabilities? Next, please. Yep, and so that um, sort of wraps up on the education front. Um, please keep an eye out. We'll try and broadcast when the modules are up for um, sort of public consumption. We are aiming to launch the class in fall 2022. So I suspect uh, things will be more available in the summer of 2022. And I'm going to turn off my mic and my video and uh, let Professor Unsworth take over. Thanks, Stephen. Um, so in academic year 2022 to 23, we anticipate opening Emma to membership by universities and colleges in the United States and Canada. If you're interested, please email us at Emma for accessibility. That's the number four at virginia.edu. Uh, we will ask for libraries to partner with disability service offices on their campus in this membership. But at the moment, uh, I do not anticipate charging libraries for membership. Uh, we do anticipate charging the offices where disability services report, which is normally the office of the provost and or the vice president for student affairs or their equivalents. Uh, membership dues will be used to sustain and develop the EMMA service to expand its coverage from print to other media like video and to continue developing the metadata schema for describing human and automated remediation that's been applied to make content accessible. And Bill, I think the next slide is yours. Hi, everybody. I need to get back to uh, my controls here. Okay, I'm, there we go. I'm not sure if you're still seeing my screen, but the last slide is uh, the links to the resources. Uh, We're not seeing it. You're not seeing it, okay. There we go. So the, these are the, uh, findings from that initial environmental scan that began this, uh, the frame project, the, the legal the white paper from the legal analysis, uh, and uh, the, the link to, uh, for, to join Emma to those that are interested. So, and then here are the, here's the contact information for, uh, yes, here we go, the four of us. You want to email us? Happy to happy to talk and provide any uh, insight and information we can. Thank you very much. <laughs>